This is from the last chapter called The Chances, uh, which is probably my favorite chapter. And uh, it's kind of poignant in the quote that it starts out with. So, in a now famous commencement speech at Stanford University, Steve Jobs urged the graduating class to stay hungry, stay foolish. Never let go of your appetite to go after new ideas, new experiences, and new adventures. Compete with yourself, not with others. Judge yourself on what is your personal best, and you'll accomplish more than you ever could have imagined. Life stops for no one, so keep moving. Stay awake and stay alive. There's no autocorrect in life. Think before texting the universe. Breaking the rules just for fun is too easy. The real challenge lies in perfecting the art of knowing which rules to accept and which to rewrite. The more you experience, experiment, take risks, and make mistakes, the better you'll know yourself, the better you'll know the world, and the more focused you'll be. And once you've found success, don't stop. It's not about being insatiable. It's about not resting on your laurels. This crazy, loopy universe that we live in is pretty entertaining, and we're only here for a short amount of time. Girl bosses make it count. Look up and look around, and if you're not finding something inspiring, then you're probably not looking hard enough. Remember, I touched every piece of clothing in those thrift stores. You have to do that with your life. An advantage of being naive is being able to believe in oneself when no one else will. I was dumb enough and stubborn enough to pour everything I had into a business called Nasty Gal and to tune out people who tried to tell me I was doing it wrong. Had I stopped at the first catty eBay seller who tried to crush my spirit, I'd probably still be peddling shoes that I'd never to be able to afford to wear. If you start listening, you should find that your heart has known what's up all along. This short life of mine thus far has been a pretty fantastic ride. There's no doubt about that. I'm resolved to making sure that doesn't change anytime soon. When I think about the future, I know that the most fantastic things are too awesome to even imagine today. Great entrepreneurs are like Indiana Jones. They take leaps before seeing the bridge because they know that if they don't, someone else will get that holy grail. That holy grail is yours for the taking. Bad bitches are taking over the world. <laughs> when I walk into the Nasty Gal offices, it's clear. Busting your butt isn't just for the wallflowers anymore. We've arrived and we're killing it. There's a chance for you, girl boss, so take it. Bad bitches are taking over the world. But Apparently. it's kind of hard out there for a, bad, <laughs> for a, for a boss for a girl. Bad bitch. <laughs> um, how many boss girls are in the audience tonight? The hardest part is putting up your hand. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a conversation that's going to be pretty informal. Um, I've known Sophia for about eight months. Yeah. Um, and so I have a bunch of questions about how she got where she is and why she's so inspiring and ballsy. Um, so my first question is, um, the first thing that I noticed about you is you seem like a very uncompromised version of yourself. Um, was there any, ever anyone uh, who told you that the key to success was being less of yourself? I feel like my path was kind of paved with the message that it was not okay to be myself from teachers telling me they thought I had Tourette's because I thought making weird noises was like funny. Um, to, you know, I don't know, getting like sent home like with like owl pellets, you know, and my teacher thinking like I was insane for like taking long, bathroom breaks like I would just go hang out in the bathroom for like th 30 minutes because I could like why not um, and even the places where I was told it was okay to be myself I found that um, I encountered a lot of issues um, so that was like the rapid learner class in third grade where like you know we sat on the floor and read newspapers and the teacher didn't believe in math and my parents still had to like chaperone me on like school trips and <laughs> Um, so, I think that's been kind of the case all along, and I was always weird, and I was always gross, and I still think farts are funny. Um, it's like one way to get a real genuine smile out of me, so like when we do these like publicity shoots, like what you don't see and what they don't write about is that there's someone making fart sounds behind the scenes, um, <laughs> because that's what happens and I can't fake it. But. Um, yeah, it's been it's been an interesting ride, you know,
being told that I don't belong and then finding a place that I do and creating a place that I do and creating a place and also a workplace and also a brand that gives women permission to be themselves. And I think that's what the most, the best brands do. And I think there's actually very few of them now. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm currently trying to balance my checkbook. <laughs> and my mom is here, the original girl boss. Um, so she's like sending me QuickBooks and all these things for me to do. Um, so I'm really, and you don't have like a Harvard MBA, so I'm really curious who taught you about business, like about accounting and sales and yeah. business insurance, things I know nothing about. <laughs> so I was really lucky to start on eBay um, where there's a framework. So it's like, okay, this is the page and you type in your stuff and you make it, there's a, you know, a template and you can always do better than what eBay gives you or what anything gives you. But um, I write in Girl Boss about finding your framework. So if I had never been given the outline to create my online store, I would never have just started a website and hoped someone like landed on it and bought something because the chance of that happening, I think, is like very slim. So I went to a place that was set up for people to sell things where there was a built-in customer base and um, I didn't pour all of my eggs into something where there like was no one hanging around looking for things to buy. Um, but it's... Um, you know, that's something that education does for certain people. That's th That didn't work for me for some reason. Um, but there's a lot of um, ways to learn in the world that aren't like the traditional education system uh, where you can find a place to learn how to, how to do what you want to do um, and then do it your own way within that. And then, I mean, that's what I did on eBay. And then I was like, okay, I'm done doing it within this. I'm good at this. I understand the mechanics of an online store. And then I took it off, you know, and then I took it onto its own website. But it was only after I knew, you know, what, what the pain points were with, you know, customer service and shipping things and things being late or getting lost and dealing with PayPal and whatever. Um, and I didn't really need eBay to moderate that for me. Cool. Um, so one of the um, really distinctive things about the book is that the title is a hashtag. And I'm curious um, as to sort of how this came about. Um, every new author I know now is creating a hashtag for their book, even if the title itself isn't yeah. one. Um, but you just like went there. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, Nasty Gal was built on social media. It was like always a conversation. I didn't have a marketing budget. I didn't have, you know, I wasn't paying for Facebook ads. I talk a lot about getting marketing for free, which social media is like an incredible platform for. Um, and there's so, there's so much, so many more platforms today than there were when I started. Um, it was just MySpace, and so you know, I talk about <laughs> MySpace. Yeah, I talk. <laughs> I talk about um, like you know hanging out in my hut in the backyard of my step aunt's pool house where I paid five hundred dollars a month and had no kitchen and subsisted on Boston Market and Starbucks iced venti soy no water whatever chais and um, and like having a MySpace friend adding robot like mach like program that was totally against MySpace's policy but whatever who cares right um, and would like type in the the user accounts of like whatever nylon magazine and I'd be like okay and these programs you could literally like filter by age by location so I was doing stuff that people are paying a lot of money for on Facebook um, for free um, so I would on my nasty gal vintage my space account if anyone have ever friends with me I don't think anyone I don't know it was like 60,000 people but um, they're probably like all in New York and LA though um, you know, add girls in Australia that were friends with, you know, Rush Magazine and between the ages of whatever. Um, so free marketing, I think, is really important. And, you know, a hashtag, I think one review of the book said some, they, ultimately it was a good review, but they said that it, like, reeks of millennial speak or something like that. And, um, I mean, at this point, like, every, I think everything's kind of like a hashtag, so I have, like, no shame about that, and I have no shame and like free marketing or asking for what I want in the world. So um, I just figured it was poignant to Nasty Gal's story that the title be a hashtag. Um, 
so sort of on that topic, um, you said something that stood out to me, which is that um, the way that you used MySpace to get, you know, connect with people may have been against their <clears throat> rules, but who cares? Um, and we were talking about this earlier, but um, you just turned 30. Um, I turned 30 like a week ago. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm 26, but I, and I was saying I sort of feel like a senior millennial because I like to go to bed at like 9.30 at night and listen to public radio and things like that. Um, but sort of just the, the, um, the concept of millennials in general um, and your sort of finding, carving out your own space, um, even if one doesn't exist, um, is something that seems like it's really key to the entire um, sort of genesis of this company and of you. Yeah. So tell Absolutely. me a little bit about it. I mean, I think... Part of it is that I'm, quote unquote, like a millennial, and I, you know, and I didn't want to do things the way my parents did them. Like I didn't necessarily like understand the the traditional path. Like it was really never for me. Um, but I think building a business online is like a an interesting way to um, indulge your like millennial like impatience. So, like you know. I mean, I love, and I love, like, film photography. Like, I have the patience. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't. Like, I'm like, where's my film? Where's my film? But, um, you know, it's digital photography, and it's, like, you know, Amazon shipping stuff overnight to us. I mean, we, we've been, like, very spoiled in a way that, I, I mean, I'm happy with it. It's fine. Um, but building a business online and building a business in general um, where you're able to bounce what works off of your customer so rapidly um, you know, on eBay, I would upload a photo that, you know, the thumbnail photo, like the most important photo that, you know, that, that I could assign to that product that was, you know, responsible for whether it sold or not at all or went for $9.99 or, you know, $300. Um, if, that, if that, like, wasn't getting the attention I anticipated in like the first half an hour of like the auctions going live because I had customers, I mean like crazy customers on eBay who would like literally camp out. They knew exactly what time my auctions were going live and would like sit there and wait to like bid or watch on, you know, the things that I was selling. And I could see if they were bidding or watching, whatever. Um, and if the image didn't work, you know, pretty soon after that auction went live, I would swap it out. Okay, maybe the silhouette of the item isn't, isn't showing up well, whatever. There's just, you know, I could log onto MySpace and see, the I up uploaded an image of every single thing that I sold um, and posted bulletins. People could comment on everything. So the ability to like learn so quickly what worked and what didn't and um, not use data. I mean, data is important. We run a big business. I have like teams that understand data, like I'm trying to understand data. But for me, it was like all, it was really like looking at photos of what sold and what didn't. That was like tra what trained my eye on how to photograph them and how not to. And the internet's just such an incredible place to get real time information and like the perfect place for anyone to build a business. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in what fashion signifies. Because um, I love fashion in the sense that it's like self-expression, um, but I'm really uncomfortable and sort of terrified of like air kissing and anything that feels really affected, double kissing. Yeah. Um, and, but I but I really take exception with the idea that being interested in fashion um, signifies some sort of frivolity. And um, in the book, you talk about you sort of seeing yourself as the anti-fashion, going to fashion week and feeling really uncomfortable and grossed out. And um, so I wanted you to sort of talk a little bit about that. You own yeah. you know, a clothing company. I know. And it wasn't fashion that got me into it. I mean, I loved vintage clothing, and I love clothing, and I love getting dressed, and I love style. Um, and Nasty Gal is a fashion brand, and we do fashion, and we, we care about fashion. And, you know, it's, it's part of everyone's life. Um, but I think you know, putting your own personal spin on things is so important. So if you walk out the door wearing, like, head to toe any trend, it's just kind of like, you know, it, it's not special. Um, and uh, and what they don't tell you, like, in the fashion world is that, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how great your outfit is. If you're not confident in who you are, it you know, you might as well, like, be invisible. <laughs> like, 
Um, it's, you know, confidence is like the most attractive thing. And there's a lot of, I mean, I don't know that many people in fashion and, and there's a lot of in, in amazing creative people that I've actually met along the way. Um, but I've, you know, I've experienced a little bit of like the dark side of like, you know, taking a friend to fashion week and her being told that like she has like the wrong shoes on or something like quite literally, you know, this is like two adults talking to one another, like at a fashion event and some girl came up to her and was like, your shoes are like all wrong or like they're like the wrong season or something like just like total bitch. Um, so like it certainly exists, but I think like jerks exist in like any world. It doesn't matter like what you're doing. There's people who think they're like really special because they're part of something. And you know, those are the people who like, aren't particularly confident and there's there's a there's a like fine line between confidence and cockiness and you know I, I don't know it's important to know that and do you think that that confidence and sort of like it doesn't matter what you're wearing it doesn't you know um is is like an essential ingredient to what this book is about and like what the sort of movement of girl boss is about i mean i think it's about ex like self-expression and exploring yourself there are certain like social norms that I think are like worth paying attention to. Like we're not wearing our pajamas right now and that would be weird if we were like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to pay some attention just, just to put, it's actually like a generous thing. Like you're putting other people at ease by not wearing pajamas like on stage to something like this. Um, I went to college with all those like, people. <laughs> I think people who like really go out of their way to like, you know, mess with things by being like so extreme, like, maybe their motivations are kind of wrong. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. So you talk about sort of that failure always has um, secret opportunities. Um, and I wondered if you could give an example of that. Hmm. The real turning point in my life, I think, was when I... I don't know if it's necessarily an opportunity. It was an opportunity to like improve my life and do a better job. But I, you know, I thought when I was a teenager that capitalism was like the root of all evil and you know the cause of like all suffering in the world. And that's there's there's some evil there everywhere in everything. And like I mean, there's evil in like religion. There's like bad people like just lurking in every corner. Um, not every I mean, no, but like not in the Apple store. Not in the Apple store. No, but like there, you know, there's always like it's like that's like human nature. There's like gonna be a contingency of people that suck no matter where you go. But like ultimately, the greater thing can be good. Um, so I tried to smash capitalism when I was like 18, 17, like you know, frequenting whatever anarchist book fairs and like you know dumpster diving and doing food not bombs and like listening to like angry music and hitchhiking and uh, you know cha I changed myself to like a tractor once or something I didn't even care about like what they were gonna drill for I was just like this sucks you know um, and yeah, it seemed like a good idea I was vegan but I like subsisted entirely on like vegan chocolate bars that I stole because they're expensive <laughs> and like vegan Thai food and I just got like really puffy and like my skin turned gray and at a certain point, I was like, I'm going to start shaving my legs again. And it's not the some, goop diet. Eat some bacon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but the real turning point in that whole, like, short-lived period of my life was when I did a walkout, which was one of my, like, it was like, I was, like, a really, really, like, good at this. Um, <laughs> and I'm not proud of it. Um, I try to be good at everything that I, you know, set out to do. So I guess maybe I wanted to be good at it. But I'm glad that it failed ultimately in my life. So I would go into these the stores, like any stores. I mean, I've like walked out with rugs like this tall from like Pier 1, like just like walked out. Like it's so absurd that nobody look, like nobody would notice. The Like when you really get caught is when you're like pocketing things. You just have to be like really over, like don't do this. Don't do it at the Apple store. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But I would push like entire shopping carts of stuff like out of stores, like no bags. I would like pick the sensors off like secretly. I'd dress like a total like soccer mom and just be like, well, you know, whatever. I'm gonna get my tampons and my basketball and my George Foreman grill and all the things I would never spend money on, you know. Um, and one time, you know, I pushed the stuff out the door. I did not set the alarm off, 
But, like, I don't know, someone was, like, watching me. And it was the one time, like, I hesitated. Like, it's really when I hesitate, I fail. Like, that's something, that's actually, like, a link from those days to these days. Like, when I think I shouldn't hire someone and I think, like, maybe they won't get along in the company or there's some amount of hesitation. And I'm like, you know what? I think we're going to keep looking. Thank you. It was so great meeting you. And then a week later, I'm like, hmm, maybe that was a, maybe, you know, I meet two more people and they, like, are way worse. And then I'm like, okay, like, maybe I should, maybe, okay. And then ultimately that's, like, never worked out. So I don't do that anymore. But, um, or, like, when you go snowboarding and you're like, oh, my God, I could totally fall right now. Like, that's when you fall. It's like when you're like, fuck, yeah. That, <laughs> like, you don't fall. Um, anyway, that is, like, that's just, like, a fact of life, I think. So I was like, I should, oh, the Foreman I grill. I don't know about this. Yeah, I don't need a George Foreman grill. I think I'm, I, I just felt I got this feeling, but I did it anyway and walked out, and this guy came running up behind me and was like, excuse me, hi, um, what, what are you, where are you going? And I was like, oh, back to my car. You know, and he was like, do you plan on paying for that? I was like, oh my God, I totally forgot. <laughs> I'm so sorry, and I tried to make some small talk to like, you know, to like disarm him or something. Maybe he thought I was just like, whatever, like, oh, I realized like when I went to the check stand that I couldn't afford it, like I didn't plan on, I wasn't, it wasn't premeditated, like. So I pushed the cart in front of him and like bolted to my car and jumped in. And I got away, but he pulled my handbag off my shoulder and my handbag, I'm so stupid, why would I need a handbag? I guess to look like a soccer mom. This is crazy. <laughs> I know. There are many crazy stories in this book and I hope you buy it on iBooks. Um, <laughs> so he grabbed my bag off my arm, had my ID in it, so stupid, but probably really good. Like. Someone wanted me to have my ID in my purse. Probably my mom wanted this to happen. I was like breaking her heart like every day at this point in my life. Hi, mom. She's here. Um, and uh, so this guy had my ID with my address on it. And I was like, well, I'm going to take control here. I'm not going to wait for this guy to come to my house and knock on my door where my landlord lives upstairs. So I like marched back. I got away and I was like, Oh, shit, I should go back. So I went back and went to the information desk, and I was like, hi. <laughs> to some person, just some person, you know, like, I need to talk to your loss prevention people. They know who I am. I just stole from you. And they, like, called up to whatever office they were in. This is, like, bigger than a Walmart kind of store that's in the Pacific Northwest. Like, it's the name of, like, a man, like a first name and a last name. Jack Bauer. It, yes. This is, it all happened in 24 hours. Um, and anyway, it was totally embarrassing. They counted up how much everything cost and ended up charging me for it. And it ended up getting dismissed. I got very lucky, but it was like, wow, like this sucks. Like I'm trying to live free and I'm not living free. What was your question? So you're a CEO now. <laughs> so, so let me tell you, I tried, I tried, <laughs> I tried to live free the wrong way and it, you know, it didn't work. So I had to figure out what did work for me to have a cool life and afford George Foreman grills, which I can now do. And I didn't know I was doing that when I started an eBay store, but I followed my nose and the rest is in Girl Boss. <laughs> um, okay, so I have one more question. I think we're gonna do Q and A from the audience. Um, so in the, in the book, you talk about elf metal. Um, yeah. You mention it. Um, I don't know how many elf metal fans there are here, but, um, Christian, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Christian, um, we were talking about maybe Mortis or Dimu Borgir, um, cause we're both, you know, I guess I didn't, I was like surprised you had heard of Yeah, Dimu listen Borgir. to loud music, grew up yeah. listening to loud music. Um, and we started talking about sort of what you learned in the mosh pit. Um, so being very young, being a girl, and like going to punk rock shows or going to metal shows, um, and like inching towards the mosh pit with yeah. curiosity, what did you learn that you sort of take with you and that all the awesome girl yeah. bosses in this audience can take with them? Well, if, you know, in the mosh pit you have to like stand kind of akimbo. If you don't know what that is, it's like when your legs are kind of like this. And if someone pushes you, it's like kind of harder for them, for you to get pushed over. Um, and, you know, I would like, you know, you have to like cross your arms and if someone bumps into you, you just kind of like 
shoulder them back. Like, no, I'm standing here. Um, and I think sometimes you have to do that with your life. Um, I don't think, you know, you do it for so long that, like, your muscles start hurting and your fascia builds up and you have to get a massage and, like, you become, like, a crusty, like a crusty soul, you know. But it's important to have, like, a certain amount of toughness, like, just in general. It's, like, good to know the difference. Um, I think it's important to be nice, but it's also important to know how to, like, you know, get what you want or, like, lay down the law. And sometimes you have to, like, stand akimbo to do it. <laughs> I guess we're going to do Q&A now. Time for questions from the audience. So um, my question is, at what point in your life did you realize that you wanted to take your life more seriously? Like, was it a day? Was it, a, like, a, a time period when you realized, like, let me get my shit together, turn around and make Nasty Gal, like this a massive, beautiful like company, you know? Thank you. <laughs> um, no, there, was no, there was like really no turning point, which is the crazy part. There was definitely like the small moments where I was like, I don't wanna like live like this anymore or my friends are just like screwing off. So I'm gonna like see where this eBay thing goes. But it, it was never like, I'm gonna get all my shit together, you know, like, everything's going to be perfect. And I, I wouldn't even, I didn't even know what getting your shit together looked like. So <laughs> I think it was very much like a gradual process. And I was, you know, still unhappy and still impatient, like even when I started eBay. So it was never like, ah, uh, this, my life has begun. Like it, th I understand what I'm going to do, like as an adult in the world. So, you know, if, you know, if I had been able to tell myself to be more patient then, I think I, I would and, you know, maybe I maybe I can travel back in time at some point. Maybe Apple will invent that. <laughs> but you know, there there was there was really no like single point. So I was wondering, um, people often uh, value success by the amount of money that they're pulling in. But what besides you know when you did start making a lot of money, like did you feel successful before that point? Or you know, if somebody is starting a business and they're not pulling in money. At what point should they feel like they're a failure versus a success? Like separating out mm -hmm. that. Um, so I talk in Girl Boss about like failure is your, your invention. So I think failure is really not continuing to try and learning from what's not working. So if you say like this is what I'm gonna do, and I have no idea if anyone in the world is gonna care about it, and you keep like dumping like your money and your parents' money or like loans like in into that. There, I mean, there's for a lot of business there is a period where you're not profitable in the beginning, and that's fine. But, you know, like knowing if there's like any amount of interest in what you're doing, I think is really important and just like tweaking along the way. And, you know, online, that's something you can do. I mean, you can do that anywhere, really, if you're creative and resourceful enough. It's just like, is this working? If it doesn't work, you know, I try to sell like those Baja hoodies, those like drug rug things that, you know, <laughs> Stevie loves them. Uh, <laughs> But people, girls do not want to like pay more than nine ninety nine for those on eBay, um, you know. So I, you know, in the beginning it was just like, oh, okay, this is like vintage. I'm gonna put vintage on here. I think this is cool, um, and you know, there's stuff that worked and stuff that didn't work. It wasn't immediately successful, but like just that I sold a few things was so exciting that you know I just didn't sell the things that didn't work anymore, and I like moved along and tried different things and. Um, and you can learn a lot from what other people are doing and what they're successful with as well. I mean, I've gone literally on LinkedIn to see what companies that are like maybe a little bit bigger than my company, like the exact like n like positions of people that they've hired for, like gone on their hiring boards and seen how they're like building out their organizations and then found those people on LinkedIn and like looked at their background and been like, oh, then maybe that's who I need to hire, you know? I mean, if you're, you can be like a detective in your life, <laughs> and uh, you know, the internet is like a really great place for that. Hi, Sophia. Hi. So I wrote down a few questions, but I have just one. Um, being that New York City is one of your one of the fashion capitals of the world, do you plan on expanding your business here, like another headquarters, or because I would love to like. Um, go to Los Angeles and work there, but I don't think I have the bones, all of the bones yet to yeah, do so. Yeah, LA is so. pretty easy. It's, you get to be all by yourself on your way home from work. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we actually have announced that we're opening stores. Woo! 
Yeah, our first of which will be in LA. Probably the first couple will be in LA, but New York is probably like, I mean, it's probably second on the list. So I would say within the next couple years, you can expect at the very least retail stores here. And if there's any great excuse for us to have an office here, I would love, I would love that. So yeah, yeah. Hello. I am a girl boss as well. Not everyone knows it yet, uh, like many of us here. And I just want to know, do you, what is one piece of advice that you would give all the other girl bosses in the crowd today? Just to leave us with. Um, I think it's just important to play to your strengths. So like know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So my job all the way you know, for the last seven years has been to hire people who are better at, than me at what they're doing. Um, and I'm not, no one's good at everything. No one should expect themselves to be good at everything. I think you have to be patient with yourself and be self, self-aware and um, self-critical to a certain extent and actually take advice from other people to learn about yourself. And you should always take it with a grain of salt. Um, but knowing what's right for you and where you're going to be successful is really important. For example, I really hate doing presentations. I don't, no one really, we don't do a ton of presentations in the company in general, but I've been asked, like, Q&As, if someone asks me a question, like, I can answer it. But, like, as a CEO, like, I'm kind of expected to be able to put together PowerPoint presentations and just, like, talk for, like, 30 minutes, which is totally like a wireless weird mic. and unnatural, and I'm going to have to figure that out at some point. Uh, but like I really avoid doing that. So I, yeah, I would say like know your weaknesses, play to your strengths, and surround yourself with people that can can prop you up and vice versa. Hi, um, I wanted to know what time you start your day. Like, is it a cup of coffee and go, or do uh -huh. you stick to a routine? I try to stick to a routine. So I was working out in the morning for a while, then I wasn't. And, but I, I usually like start my day with like a smoothie, and I'll do phone calls from and what, home. What time? Uh, I wake up at like seven thirty maybe, um, and have like a smoothie and a coffee and a water, and a shower, and um, I wish sometimes I try to go for a walk before work, and I'll try to schedule calls from home because it doesn't matter where I am. Then it feels like. I had like a long morning, um, but I, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night, I look at my phone, I wake up in the morning, I look at my phone, I go to bed, I'm looking at my phone, so I never really stop working. Um, but it's like a pretty normal morning, I think. There's nothing super special about it. Every day is really different, so, but there's a lot of meetings. So in the beginning it was like, I'm at a computer editing photos, I'm at a, at a computer responding to customer emails, I'm at a you know, computer like printing out shipping labels. It was a lot of computer work. Um, at a certain point, it became a lot of meetings and like just talking, talking to my team, people with better ideas than me, bringing those ideas to the table and me being like, holy shit, I have nothing to contribute. And sometimes I do, but it's like really cool when I don't. Um, but it's more conversations and in conference rooms and you know meeting people in the office. Yeah, it's different. Um, which I enjoy because it's just more more varied than like, and I, I really enjoyed like printing out shipping labels. I did, but yeah, it's a it's like a different kind of challenge and like a different way of organizing myself today. Hello, you've become very successful since your eBay days, but how do you continue to challenge yourself? Hmm, I don't. I mean. I have a business that does that for me. Like, I feel challenged like every day when I go to work. I feel challenged by the people who, you know, I'm expected to lead. I feel challenged by the occasions that I'm expected to rise to. Um, I've put myself in a place that, you know, I don't have the pedigreed like experience to like necessarily take on. So I have a lot to learn. Uh, and uh, and that's like a huge challenge, and I don't expect that to go away anytime soon. I don't have to. I don't have to invent things to challenge myself. I think that's probably like a good place to be, and I think everyone should try to put themselves in places like that. And it's totally terrifying, but that's when you learn, and that's when you grow. Hi, 
My name's Erin, I'm 22, and I'm also the founder and CEO of an online store, and I wanna know how you relax. I'm like going crazy, and it's like an emotional roller coaster, yeah. and I need to chill, and I, I don't still know do what that. to do. I do that all the time. Oh, I, I try to schedule like trips, like even three day trips out of town, just like two nights away. Uh, it's still hard to turn off, but it feels like, it can feel like a week, even if you just get away for three days. Um, getting away from my stuff and all the things that I think make me comfortable, but also like stress me out. And I'm like, why, why is that there? Who put that there? You know, it's like getting out of your house, I think is good. I'm not very good at relaxing. That's something I'm still trying to figure out. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll learn how to meditate at some point. I, I, don't, I think you can relax like when you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't, you know, and I probably won't even then. I think I'm like, yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm, I'm not good at that. So maybe that helps. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us. Thanks and, for coming. Um, also, I wanted to ask you, you touched upon for a little bit in the book about being an introvert and being kind of um, worried about what people thought of you. And I wanted to know how you overcame that and what kind of advice you would give to someone to be their best self. That's a really good question. Um, I think there's a little bit of like fake it till you make it that, that like works. So if you look like you're questioning yourself or you look like you're doubting yourself, other people will know that you're doubting yourself and they like treat you differently. Um, so like cultivating a certain amount of, I don't even know what it is, just like an ability to like say what you think and I mean, even for me, like in, in these things, I'm like, I could just ramble and sometimes I just have to end my sentence with a, mm, like a, I'm done. I think I'm done. I'm not, I don't know if I'm done, but I sound really confident. Um, and that's like a really weird thing to learn to do this. Like, it's weird. Um, so like, it can be learned. Um, I, I don't know, I hope, does that answer your question? Fake it till you make it. You'll, you'll make it. <laughs> um, thank you guys so, so much. Thank you. For coming out for this. And thank you to Sophia for writing this book.